Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonillo. On this episode, I am very lucky to be doing a crossover episode with uh, Michael Callahan, who is the host at Where We Go Next. Uh, Michael and I are good friends, and we've been wanting to kind of do this crossover episode for, for some time, and so I'm glad we were able to finally do it. Where We Go Next is a podcast that focuses on in-depth conversations with a variety of people challenging the ways we think and create and live. Uh, Michael has talked to uh, founders, writers, journalists, artists, educators. Uh, some of his guests have also been on uh, Converging Dialogues as well. So there's some crossover with guests as well, which is always nice. Uh, Michael and I are good friends, and uh, we, we thought this would be a, a nice way to kind of show a behind-the-scenes uh, take on you know our podcast respectively, but also the the importance of how to um, really try to have public conversations, um, you know, ethically, responsibly, um, and how how we can you know put others first. We start by talking about why we decided to do this crossover episode. I explain how uh, converging dialogues started and, and why, what some of the motivations were. He explains how where we go next started and and what his ideas and motivations were, and we talk about how we treat our guests and what our kind of you know way of trying to get the best out of all of our guests that come on. Uh, we talk about uh, the process for asking good questions, our motivations for interviews, the importance of active listening, what are specific processes for each episode. Uh, the legacy of the podcast with, you know, whenever we decide to hang it up in 20, 30 years later, you know, what, how people will kind of look back on it and uh, many other topics. Uh, this was such a fun uh, conversation to have, cool experience. Um, we, we really enjoyed ourselves having this conversation and I'm quite pleased with how it turned out. So I'm, I'm very, very curious to, to see the response. As always, you can find this podcast uh, on convergingdialogues.substack.com. Uh, you can also find it on YouTube. So get over to both those places. Uh, subscribe, like, follow, share with your friends. And uh, now I bring you this uh, crossover episode with Converging Dialogues and where we go next. Xavier, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, I'm glad that we're both glad that you're here. <laughs> yes. I wonder where we're going to go next. So that's, that's what's important. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a long time coming. You and I have been friends for several years now. We first met online all the way back in 2020, I think shortly after both of us started our podcasts. My podcast started in late September and yours started in early November. Do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's what's so interesting is that we kind of started unbeknownst to either of us around the same time. I think it was like a two month separation there. I'm looking forward to this conversation because it is going to be different, I think, than the kind that either of us are used to on our respective podcasts because you've interviewed hundreds and I want to make sure I have this number right. As of this recording, you have conducted 302 interviews in about the same amount of time that I have conducted as of this recording, 94. So you're a little more prolific than me, but we decided to do something a little bit differently today because we wanted to have a more free flowing, not a host guest dynamic, so to speak, but two hosts of two podcasts who like and are familiar with each other, who want to talk about our experiences being podcasters, how we've grown over the last several years, some of the more interesting conversations we've had, how we've changed and kind of just see where it goes from there. Yeah, that was absolutely right. It was cool because we've been wanting to do this for a while. And then it's how would we do it or what kind of topics. And I think it's a cool, at least for me, a sort of a challenge because you're right. I'm either most of the time the host like you are. And I've been on a few other podcasts sometimes as a guest, but that's not very often. So this is cool because we both are hosts all the time. So we both are just talking to each other about that. I also thought about like, what's the point, right? Like, why would we do this? And so I think there's definitely a, a healthy amount of listeners that listen to both our podcasts. A decent amount of cross-pollination. Yeah, yeah. I think that might be interesting for those listeners in particular, if they listen to both and be like, oh, wow, there's, a, there's like a link up, a mashup or something, right? That could be cool in that way. A crossover episode, if you will. Yeah. Or like, what was that album called where Jay-Z and Linkin Park did the whole, the mashups? Oh. Collision Course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm not sure who's Jay-Z or Linkin Park in that scenario, but. <laughs> we can let listeners figure that out. 
but I'm crawling in my skin with that comparison, <laughs> Xavier. <laughs> That's funny. So I was thinking about, I was like, what's the point? And I think that as you were laying out there nicely is we both have done a lot of episodes. We both have been doing it for the same time. And I think that even before 2020, there was a plethora of podcasts out there. And there's all these reasons of like, well, why should someone do one, right? Why should you do another one? I'm sure there's something like what you want to talk about out there. And I think it's interesting how generally the landscape of media has changed and altered and evolved. And there's obviously pros and cons to podcasts, but I think that there's a bunch of things you've learned. There's a bunch of things I've learned, but I think that people can hear and listen to how we figured out what makes sense in terms of content, but also in terms of responsibility or ethics or respectability or things like that. So I think there's a really cool instructive way, maybe a little meta, but I think there's a cool instructive way of saying like, here's some of our experiences, but also why it's important and why it's important in a fast evolving media landscape. What would you say is the main thrust or theme of your podcast in your words? And then number two to something you just said, there's hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, millions. What was the inciting incident that made you decide to start your own? knowing that there were already so many out there. I think for the podcast dream, <laughs> which is still, I guess, kind of there, is I legitimately wanted to do live, not like recording live, but have people of totally different perspectives or opinions or positions or whatever and have a space to have a dialogue. So the name is intentional. It was not meant to be a debate. It was not meant to be an argument or things like that. I see all those things a little bit different. Dialogue is how do you listen and hear from somebody's position or wherever side they're on and listen and try to learn something about that other side or that other position that's not your own and what you can glean from it. And then hopefully the other person would do the same. And then you converge somewhere in the middle, hopefully. There's more divergence, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, that was the idea. And I've done that a few times. It's a lot harder than I realized, mostly because people are very skittish about doing that. Some people, they have legitimate like <laughs> career things that they don't want to get involved in. I understand, but a lot of people are very somewhat agnostic to it. Maybe they've done debates with other people before and they feel like it's a kind of a secret ambush or something. And what became out of that very quickly was, I'll just do it then. I'll be the person that talks to one person of one view. And then I'll talk to somebody else that has uh, another view. So it could be on pick your topic. Let's say abortion. That's an easy one, I guess. Someone's pro-life. And then like, next week I talk to someone that's pro-choice. And then I release them, not next to each other necessarily, but somewhat more connected. That more or less is how it's fallen out. If sorts is, is like, oh, okay, this is usually how it goes. So you gazed upon the podcast marketplace and could not find what you wanted. So you made it yourself. Yeah. So that kind of goes to your second question about, yeah, there's a million of these podcasts. Why at that time? People had friends or other people had told me they're like, you might be good at that. And then I was thinking, no, I'm not good at that. I got no, I'm, I don't know. I, I'm not going to do a podcast. That sounds ridiculous. There's a million of them. And they're like, you should do it. You should do it. And I was like, eh, I don't know. You know, 2020 was during pandemic. So I think for most people, early March is the pandemic and people were inside and thought it was going to be the bubonic plague again or whatever it was in March. And then we realized it wasn't that bad. 2020 was still a hard year for a lot of people. And then we had the stuff in the summer with some of the George Floyd stuff and racial kinds of topics. And then we had the election. Like 2020 is a pretty wild year when, when we look back on it, I guess. It certainly was. So like a lot of people, I mean, I was at home and I was consuming a lot of information. Now, if people follow me online or they've listened to my podcast, they'll know that I read a lot. So I'm already <laughs> reading often. But I was also consuming news and consuming other things. I just felt like I was getting a lot of information overload of sorts. And I was like, I should do something with all of this. I think I'm an okay writer. Some people say I'm okay, I'm good, but I don't know. And I'm also kind of a perfectionist with writing and I'm like slow and it takes forever. And I enjoy writing, but I don't enjoy the process of writing. It's a lot for me. I like the end result, but like the process isn't enjoyable. So I'm like, okay, so I don't do it that often. So I said, well, I talk way too much. I listen to people for a living you know what, that might be okay. So then I said, the podcast actually might work. So then I said, that that makes sense. So I'll do it now. This is a way for me to take all the stuff I'm learning, take all the information I'm getting, and how do I put it back out there by engaging with people that I'm reading their work or reading their research or reading their opinions. And that's how it started. It just keeps going. 
sometimes podcasts can change or anything can change over time, but you don't realize how much it's changed because it's almost like a ship of Theseus sort of situation where all of a sudden you realize that all the wood in the ship has been replaced. Do you feel like the Converging Dialogues podcast of 2024 is the same one as it was in 2020? Or do you feel like it is much different now or somewhere in between? I would say that it's like the band that's been around for 20 years and there's two or three original members and then there's two or three like newer members. Always had varied interest in philosophy and history, obviously the social sciences, clinical psychology in my world, politics. I actually really love politics, the study of it. But yeah, there's just a lot of that stuff always. But I think, you know how it is when you start out, you kind of have to build. But I was always reading those things. And so what ended up happening was it was like, okay, it kind of started in a way of like very similar themes or maybe similar types of guests. I think it was a lot of heavy on the social science in the beginning, which isn't surprising considering the world I come out of. Okay. But then as I got to do it, I got to branch out. And so sometimes I'll find myself asking myself, I'll say, is this just a history podcast now? No, it's definitely not. Is this just a philosophy podcast now? No. But it's all of those things, actually. And it really just comes from curiosity, a big interest in those things. I have a rule for myself. I've told this to some guests. I will not have a conversation with a guest if I have not read their book in its entirety beforehand, if they've written a book. It's a rule for me. I have to read the entire thing. So yeah, I really will have interest in a lot of different things. It's not like a publisher said I should have someone on, so I should do it. Or someone told me like, I really genuinely have that interest typically of what the person is. And I've read the entirety of if they've written a book, what they've written. So that stuff's just important to me. Yeah. So it's, just, it's definitely evolved. How many books would you say you read a year on average? I can tell you my Goodreads. I have been keeping track of this since 2020. In 2020, I read 123 books. In 2021, 130. In 2022, 127. And in 2023, 122. So about 120s every year. A book every three days. So I have books everywhere in the house. My family hates me. It's the space is really the issue. And I'm always reading different things at the same time. I don't just read one book, finish it and put it down. I'm reading like four or five at the same time. I'll read like two chapters in one. I'll take my notes. Okay. I'll think about it. And then I'll like, okay, let me pick up the other one. So if I'm reading something on suburbs in the United States and what that's like, okay, I'll read a couple of chapters of that. And then I'll pick up the other book on, you know, neuroscience or history of the Mongol empire, or, you know, whatever, you know, I, I just try to mix it up. So that way it keeps me, keeps me interested. And so. <laughs> That's cool. I can't imagine jumping around like that. I feel like my brain would get scrambled. That's a real skill. <laughs> I enjoy reading. It's my favorite pastime. I want to ask you the same thing. The thing I like about your podcast and the episodes I've listened to is there's such a very present quality that you have in your interviews where you're very tuned in, you're very locked in. And I'm sure some of them are already pre-made. I know you have your outline like I do and stuff, but I do get the sense that a lot of that is in the moment, these follow-up questions based on what someone will say. I think it's great. They get right to the heart of it, right? There's no, okay, well, set us up and define us this thing. It's like you just get right there and it's great. It's a skill for sure. So how did you get into this and what your kind of motive was of doing it initially? And then, yeah, how it evolved for you and how it looks very different maybe now or maybe it doesn't from September of 2020? First of all, thank you. Similar to how you saw like a void in the marketplace of civilly disagreeable conversations you wanted to have where you didn't always want to have to agree with your guests and you want to be able to challenge your guest, but not be argumentative or some kind of yelling, talking head a la Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or every gosh darn news channel that exists right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think similarly, when it comes to the kinds of questions I like to ask my guests is really motivated by two factors. The first one being, and I imagine you feel this too. It's like whenever I get any guest to come on the show, I'm so blown away and flattered that they would volunteer time that they could literally be using to watch paint dry. Yeah, yeah. The older you get and the more responsibilities you have and the less and less time you have in your day, you become just ever more aware of how precious and limited time is. So when someone, especially, but this is true of every living human being on earth, but especially some of the people we've talked to, their days are really tightly scheduled. 
they have meetings and seminars and public speaking events and, you know, they're running companies or restaurants or God knows what, writing their sixth book. And they carve out an hour, 90 minutes, sometimes your podcast, four hours of their time when they could be out to dinner with their husband or their wife or like literally just taking a nap. And the fact that they're doing our podcasts rather than anything else is always something that I carry with a great deal of responsibility. And that motivates me to not waste their time. Like I am so deathly afraid of wasting their time. How that manifests is I'll do my best to, if they exist, listen to at least parts of other podcasts they've been on. And when you do that, you start noticing patterns where the same five or six questions are asked in the first 30 minutes of almost every podcast. And some of it is understandable. There's just some housekeeping you need to do at the beginning. Like, who are you? How did you get interested in this thing? But I find that there are oftentimes either more interesting ways to get to those same biographical or relevant points. And this is just me on my soapbox. I believe that it is incumbent on the part of the host to take the weight off of the guest in that regard as much as you can by building that information into the question you're asking so they don't have to do the work of answering it. And then you can just slice into the actual question that you want to ask rather than ask, so why did you start the restaurant? Or why did you start the rocket company? I'm like, I've listened to them on six different podcasts and they always give the same answer. So I could either waste my audience's time by having them repeat the same answer that the audience could hear on six other podcasts, or I could regurgitate that information and use it as a way to get into a question I don't think I've heard them answer in a way that is relevant to the information that I actually want to talk about. That's one. And then two, when you're actively engaged in listening to a guest who's really interesting talk about something, you'll be thinking of questions in your head as you're listening to it, hoping the host asks them. And oftentimes there is such low hanging fruit, like a guest will be like, and that's when I realized that my sister had been kidnapped. And you're like, oh man, wow, I can't wait to hear about how the kidnapping resolved itself. <laughs> and then the host will be like, so moving on from your teenage years, I see here that I'm like, no, what? no, stay here. Stay on the kidnapping. <laughs> right. Or what happens other than that is that they'll jump to, so tell us your thoughts on climate change. And it's like, wait, wait, no, I don't care about that right now. I Just tell me about the kidnapping. <laughs> exactly. You know, when I'm able to remain present, because it's hard remaining present in a situation like that. This is why I have such a deep respect for actors, because in a way, we are doing a variation on what actors do. Years ago, I did this actor director lab with a brilliant directing teacher. Her name is Judith Weston. Her book was required reading at USC when I did grad school there. And a requirement to take her directing actors lab, which I took for several years and was one of the most rewarding times of my life was before I could do that, I had to, and all directors to be eligible for it, had to take a weekend long acting for directors intensive where we did eight hour days, Saturday, Sunday. And it was just a group of directors and she would give us scenes and we would have to do acting exercises with each other. And we would have to memorize lines and act in scenes and be present. And this is a, a hot tip for anyone listening. If you want to be able to tell the difference between a good actor and a bad actor, and this is no knock on community theater, but if you go to like a local play or watch like a short film that was made by someone who's just starting out or actors who don't have a great deal of experience, because this is very hard. It's very hard to both memorize all of your lines and all of your blocking, blocking being where you move in and around the scene, to memorize all of that and be present enough so that if you and I were doing a scene together, Xavier, I look like I'm actively listening to everything you're saying. And when I respond, I deliver my memorized lines in a way that makes it seem like I just thought them up and I'm responding to how you just delivered your lines. And the best way to spot bad acting, and this is an exercise that directors will sometimes do in rehearsals if they feel like the actors they're working with are stuck in a rut and not really listening and responding to their acting partner, but rather waiting for their turn to speak. If you have a two actor scene, you pull a one actor aside and you say, okay, I'm not going to tell the other actor. But instead of you saying, I just found out my mom died in a sad way, I want you to come in and say it laughing. 
You call action. Actor one comes in. They say, I just found out my mom died. And if the other actor doesn't respond in a way that makes sense for how the other actor just said that line and they just deliver it like the way that they'd memorized it and rehearsed it at home, bad acting because they're not being present. They're not listening. They're not being in the moment. They're not responding to what their scene partner is giving them, right? When we had to do those exercises with each other to actually actively listen to your scene partner and respond in a way while keeping your lines memorized, I would come home from like these eight hour sessions at 7 p.m., 6, 37 p.m. and pass out 30 minutes later because being that actively present with someone else is exhausting. And now granted, like hosting a podcast is different from playing a character, but the act of being present and hearing what the other person is saying to you, it's difficult. I don't always nail it. And there are times where I've listened back to episodes of the show as I'm editing them or going over them. And I'm like, wow, how did I miss? They just said something profound and I didn't pick up on it and I didn't follow up on it. And I'm sure you have stories of episodes that you've listened back to and you're like, why didn't I go down this path with them? To your point, Xavier, I think we're just trying to make the podcasts that we would want to listen to. Mm -hmm. Two things I wanted to respond. There was one small thing, just like a footnote here is like, you said that you'll listen a little bit or in part to some of the other podcasts, the, the guests, the ones I've been on. I'm the opposite, totally blind. I don't want to hear any other podcast or any other interview they've done. I'm totally blind. I have made two exceptions to that in all of the episodes I've done. I like it completely blind. And a part of it is because I feel like unconsciously that gets somewhere in my head. Oh, I heard someone else do it that way. Or now I'm thinking about how I don't want to do it that way. So it's so interesting how you're like, I totally get your rationale. And I think it's like super awesome. I wish I could do that. I couldn't do it that way though. Cause like, you're right. There is a kind of, all right, so tell me about your background and like, where did you know, where was your education and how long have you been working at, you know, there is a kind of script, if you will, which is fine. But I guess for me, it's, I still want to be tainted. So it's so interesting hearing you say, how you use that because I'm seeing it one way, but you're seeing it another way of like, you do all that work and then you put it into how you can get the thing that everyone else didn't get. So I'm also trying to do the same. I want to have the conversation that nobody else has had with them. I want it to be unique and by nature of just people are different, that's going to happen, but really get that by not looking at that, which is so interesting how it's, we both want the same thing, but we go about it in different ways. That's really interesting. There's no wrong way to do it. And I think that what you're articulating is totally valid. I think for me also, let's say the interview is about a book that they wrote. For me, listening to other podcasts about that book can open my mind to topics and themes about the book that I might not have been able to see or even think about because my mind is just my own mind. It's a beautiful thing about art. You can have five people looking at an abstract painting, let's say, and you'll come away with five different meanings for that painting. And each one of those five meanings can be legitimate because the art belongs to the viewer as much as it does to the artist once the art is public. And so you might get five different interpretations that are all rooted in those five individuals' histories, emotions, experiences, what they're feeling in the moment. And so for me, there's also a lot of value in hearing other people talk about that book or talk about whatever that thing is with that guest because I might think, oh, wow, I don't think I would have ever thought about that particular angle. And now that's sending my mind in some interesting places and not always in the places that person was asking them about, but it might just start like a ping pong effect in my mind where I was like, oh yeah, they mentioned their father. You know what? I've just realized that they've never been asked about their mother in any of the episodes that I've listened to. And, and their mother's such a fundamental part of the middle of the book or something like that. Right. Or to my earlier point about wanting to ask the questions that sometimes I get frustrated, weren't asked. That's the awesome thing sometimes about having your own podcast is I'll listen to a host, ask a guest a question. The guest will give an answer, says something really interesting. And that host, for whatever reason, they have their own agenda. They're their own host. It's no critique, but they won't ask the question that I would have wanted to ask myself. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll literally just transcribe what the host asked, how the guest answered, read that back to the guest when they're on my show and be like, tell me more about that. And that I think serves two functions. I find that guests, I think like all of us, like myself, if I know that someone has done like a lot of work to understand me and to appreciate me and like done their homework, so to speak, they like point out something specific in something I did. It flatters me and it also makes me like them a lot. It's a trick of psychology. It's like a twofold thing. 
I get to ask a follow-up question or I get to get more information from a, a podcast or a question that wasn't even my own initially. So I use that as a stepping stone to somewhere interesting. But also I find that it opens the guest up much more quickly. So I'll ask a question like that within like the first 15 or 20 minutes. And I think you've experienced this, Xavier. You sometimes don't have a ton of time to talk to this person. And even if you have a couple hours, in the grand scheme of time, two hours is not a lot of time. So it's not just about asking your questions. It's about trying to get the guest into a emotional mental state where they will open up and give answers that are deep and personal and profound and not rehearsed. Because sometimes we talk with people, you and I, who've been on dozens of podcasts or television or radio, and they've talked about their subject of interest dozens or hundreds of times. Sometimes it's about trying to shake them out. They're not consciously trying to be redundant or repetitive or boring or anything. But I think when you know a lot about a subject and you've studied it deeply for many decades, you subconsciously or consciously develop answers to questions that you just recite. And so how do you either shake the guest out of that or open them up to more avenues? And so for me, I'm always trying to think of ways to not only take the conversation in novel directions, but also open the guest up so that they respond in novel ways. You do it well. I mean, it's, it's very, very, very good. And there are some episodes that stand out more than others, for sure. I mean, we're just like, wow. You can feel almost the guest, you know, just jello in your hands. They're just super vulnerable and relaxed. It's great when you can hear it. The thing that you were just saying now about certain guests and things like that, one of the things when I was starting out was I was, like I told you, I was reading all this stuff, right? All these books and things like that. Because when I read, I'm very interactive. I'm writing on the margins, I'm underlying, bracketing, dog earing, like that's how I read books. And sometimes when I'm reading a book, I'll say, well, what did they mean by this? Or I'll have a question like, yeah, but have you considered like this? How does that make sense with the work done by so-and-so or whatever? Why wasn't that addressed? And it's not like critical. It's just, I want to hear a little bit more of this expanded on that. So I feel like such a privilege and an honor when I actually get to do that now. It's just, I still pinch myself. I mean, there's, there's some guests where I'm like, how did that happen? Did I have that conversation? That's, no, that was somebody else. And the thing is, like when I'm doing it, I'm just in a zone. So I'm just like, okay, I got this person next week. I got this done. I'm at this phase, whatever. There's a rhythm to it. And I don't ever really take time to contemplate like, wow, like that was super cool. It's just a conversation. It's not like I did research with this person or something, but just the fact of you were saying they could do it doing a million else things in the world. And they gave me three hours. It's just like crazy to me. Can I actually leapfrog off this real quick? Because I think you've touched on a really interesting and dare I say, fundamental difference between our two podcasts besides the subject matter, which is asking follow-up questions that either challenge the text directly or build on it, or just have curious questions about like, how did you reach this conclusion? They are the subject you're researching and you are preparing the questions you're going to ask as if you are studying them in a way. And that fits very neatly with your own background and your interests as a philosopher and psychologist. And it got me to think like, okay, well, what are the notes that I'm more often than not jotting down? And what is the thing within that that is driving me to write those questions? Like what interests me about my guests? I had Andy Lapsa, who was the CEO and is the CEO of Stoke Space, and they're making reusable rockets. Those conversations will often be more technically focused and more about, I think this technology is really cool and I want my audience to learn about it. And so we're going to do a deep dive on the tech. I would say 80% of the conversations, regardless of the subject matter, are actually all rooted in my desire to understand the story of the human being and what drove them to do what they do. As an example, Chef Johnny Ray's own. He's the co-founder and head chef at Hal and Ray's. It's this insanely popular Nashville hot chicken spot here in Los Angeles that really blew up after Jonathan Gold gave it a glowing review back in 2016. And if you ever visit Los Angeles, anyone who's listening to this who lives in Los Angeles, you have heard of Hal and Ray's. It started Nashville hot chicken craze in Los Angeles on the West Coast. And it is some of the best food, regardless of cuisine, that you will ever have. And for me, it was not just wanting to talk to him about how awesome I think his restaurant is, but I wanted to find out what specifically drove him to do this. And then when we were talking and he talked about the premature death of his dad and finding his dad's body, I'm like, ah, that's not what drove him to do Nashville hot chicken. That's a separate story, which we also talk about in the podcast. To use one more example, I had the pleasure and honor of speaking with Andrew Sullivan, a very well-renowned, famous 
cultural journalist out of Britain, self-described more conservative in the UK sense writer who was a very early advocate of gay marriage and gay rights in general in the UK and also here in the US. And he's a brilliant writer. And I had him on in the context of discussing the anthology of his works that he collected into a single book called Out on a Limb. And I spoke to him after the book had been out for a few months. So I listened to him talking on NPR and I listened to talking to other places. And I come from a writing background myself and I'm listening to all these conversations and even conversations from like decades ago. I was like, let me listen to like young Andrew in like 1994 and see what people are asking him about then. And they're all just asking him about his political views, which is fair. Most of his articles are inherently political. He writes about politics. But for me, I was like, what is it like to be someone like Andrew who loves the written word, who loves writing, but the thing that he's driven to write about isolates him from so many other people. When he was writing in the late 80s, early 90s about the AIDS crisis, when he was at parties and watching his friends die, or what is it like to write something that you know you believe in, like fighting for gay marriage against a conservative base that disagrees with you, or writing about some topic that's more conservative and then you have liberals hating you? What is it like as a writer who's writing about topics that isolate you from other people? Because writing in and of itself, even if you're writing about non-political things, is an inherently lonely profession because you have to squirrel yourself away and just be by yourself for hours at a time. So what is it like to already be doing a lonely profession like writing, but then also be writing about topics that further often isolate you from society because maybe they just disagree with your views or even hate you? I really felt like I was able to get to something with him that I hadn't heard anyone else talk about. I love to try and get to the understory of what drives the person to do what they do, whether they're a journalist or a restaurateur or a CEO or an educator. What would you say is the thing or things that you look for? Or is there any kind of binding cohesive tissue that you could connect like interview to interview regardless of subject matter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I was listening to you say all that, I had a, a few thoughts about, it's very interesting. You're very person-centered. You care really much about who they are. Like, yeah, okay, Andrew Sullivan writes about politics and he's wrongfully aligned on certain topics or whatever, or maligned, excuse me, on certain things. That's such a nice way to think about a guest. Let me cut through all of that. And let me get the thing that most people aren't getting because that would be interesting. I'm a little bit different. And I think I know why. In my day job, I'm a clinician, I'm a shrink <laughs> of, uh, of some sort, whatever you want to call it. I'm a therapist. At the moment, I, I do therapy all day, right? That's what I do and with different populations and things like that. I've done different things before within psychology, but for now I do therapy. I also teach as well, but just part-time. And I don't do that the way you do it because, not because I'm less interested in people. I'm obviously very interested in people. <laughs> I went to school for a long time <laughs> to, <laughs> to figure out human behavior. But two things, I'm very transparent about what I do for my day job. I feel like it's a little bit different for me. If I start asking about people's like kind of personally, like how they do things or whatever, there's that whole like, oh God, like he's analyzing me or something like that. And so I get that a lot. So it's harder for me in some ways, but also the moments I have done it, I won't say which episodes, but there's been one or two moments where I've done this. That is something I can't turn off. I just go into therapy mode. Like I can't not. Then this isn't a guest for me. It's not a client, of course, but it sort of kind of feels that way. Because then like I can't, if somebody says something like about their mom or their dad or whatever with the interpersonal relationships, if I start thinking that way too much, then like my follow-up questions are very clinical or therapeutic. I can't not think that way. <laughs> it's a little bit harder for me. So your insights into what, drives you to ask questions in a certain way or what keeps you from asking questions in a certain way. I think that's really interesting. My way of doing it isn't better. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, no. The way that you ask your questions is great. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing lacking. No, I didn't take it that way. I'm just saying I really like how you do that. And there are moments where I wish I could do that. It's not that I don't have the capacity to. It's just that whole thing of like, I can't turn it off. I guess where it's, again, similar kind of framework maybe, but just done differently. So I tend to be a little bit more Again, this isn't to say that you're not, but I tend to be a little bit more cerebral in some <laughs> components here or, or maybe information heavy in some ways. But my agenda, if you know, it was scare quotes, is I don't really have one. You don't either, which is great. I've heard so many podcasts. We can name names if we want, but we don't have to. Where there's an agenda. I was making a joke earlier, but it was like, 
they're telling you about something that they just wrote a book or they have certain research they're doing and they're like, okay, so what do you think about race relations right now? Or what do you think about the upcoming election that's going on? It's just, what is this? How are we fitting this together? The person that has a podcast could be like a big name or they could have a big podcast. So maybe they get a little bit away with it. But my, really my agenda is the person, whatever they're into that two, three, four, whatever, how much time I have with them, that's all I'm into. I'm not thinking about anything else. That's why I don't really talk about my day job that much or other things. I might make references to it, but it's not about me or it's not about other certain aims I might want to do with the pilot. Like literally each guest, 110%, whatever they're into, I'm into it. And I, I will, I think sometimes try to rub off on that of sorts of like, okay, tell me everything. Because the thing that you said earlier is how it translates practically. I think of it as a, such a gift, such a blessing. Why would I spend time trying to fit it into an agenda or a lens that I have or whatever that I want to do? And if there's a little bit of me just by temperament where I'm not really into one or two things too much, like I do like different things. But even if that was the case, whatever they're doing, that's what I'm into. I want to spend all of my time downloading everything that they can give to me. And so my questions are always about the best version of that person based on what they do. So when I'm talking to a neuroscientist, I can use some of my understanding of neuroanatomy and neurophysiology and biological bases. Okay, that's cool because that can really help where they can be like, oh, okay, this person isn't completely ignorant about this. I can go along with this and that can push it. And if I don't know something, I say something. And stuff with history is like, history is cool because it's like, tell me everything about the Mongol Empire or whatever it is. It's great. Like, I, I want to get all of that. I will say that where things do cross with my interests, so let's say it's in social sciences generally or psychology or things like that, it's a little bit like, oh, I'm fluent in this language. Oh, yeah, that's kind of home base. Oh, I know this stuff. Okay. And then it, it's a little bit easier. It's a little more conversant of sorts, but it's not let me show you what I know and let me see what you know. Or well, what do you think about my idea that I've been cooking up? It's more like I'm still wanting to know everything about them, but the language of it's more conversant. And philosophy, I mean, again, I'm not trained formally in philosophy, but it's a huge interest since I was really young. And I've read a ton of the stuff and I talked to many people and philosophy is interesting in that way. I always have good conversations with philosophers because my mind kind of works in a similar way. So we can do the three hours and we can just be like, there's no answer to this, but let's talk about it for an hour and a half and let's just see like what it could be. And I'm very comfortable with that. So there's a comfortability there. So anyways, all that to say in my style about how I'm doing things with guests or how I'm orchestrating things, it's very them centered and very much not me centered. And it's interesting because you do the same, but just in a different way. Again, that overlap is really cool to see those pieces there. To go back to the directing actors analogy, Hopefully no future guests listen to this episode because I'm giving my tricks away here. <laughs> but I have found that when working with actors, especially like in a difficult scene or a scene that requires them to be very vulnerable, one way that I found to make them more comfortable in a vulnerable or emotional scene is if I have something within my own biography that relates to the subject of the scene or is adjacent to it somehow, I might not know what it's like to lose a friend to murder, but maybe I can think of something that is deeply personal to me that was very traumatic and that I can share with them before we rehearse. And in a way where I can tie it into the scene, I can be like, today, we're going to be doing a really difficult scene. It's going to require you to go to some harrowing and emotional places. I'm recognizing now before we start our rehearsal that it's going to be hard and that it's going to be exhausting. But you know what this scene was making me think about as I was preparing for it? You know, I've never had experience with this exact thing from this scene, this exact scene. But I did experience a kind of, and then I'll share something true, but I'll share something that in the real world outside of this particular rehearsal moment that I might not share with anyone outside of like my closest friends and my family. But I have learned that by deploying something very personal and vulnerable in a specific scenario like that, where I am asking the actor or actors to go somewhere that puts them in a very scary place. Or even if the scene isn't about anything particularly dark, but is going to require the actor to make like a fool of themselves, or they're just scared to do it, or I can sense it in them, right? 
I have found that making yourself vulnerable first makes it easier for them to be vulnerable second. Yeah, absolutely. And so in a similar way, if it's a sensitive subject matter, or if I know that I'm going to want to ask something of them that delves into something personal, that by offering something of my own, but only really if it relates to what we're talking about, or if it's adjacent, that by offering myself first, one, it shows that we've got equal skin in the game here. I'm going to talk about something relevant that can tie into what we're talking about. Again, what are some shortcuts that you can use to get someone to be relaxed, vulnerable, comfortable with what is basically at the end of the day, a stranger, me, I'm a stranger to these people. And so that's just one way that I try and get to something authentic as quickly as I can. Because in my view, and I imagine you're the same way, trying to get to authenticity whether it's emotional authenticity, intellectual authenticity, just authenticity in general, and to get someone off script. It's always about thinking about how to get there. It's like trading. Let me give you something of mine because I'm about to ask you for something back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. And there's elements of that I do in my day job every day. It's, uh, yeah, I totally agree. It can be very effective, especially if you're a little stuck or you're a little, uh, just a little defensive or guarded or whatever, so... I want to talk about the active listening piece that you mentioned. And you gave your example with theater, so I'll share two brief stories. Yes, please. When I was in one of my internship or externship, it was one of my training rotations for my doctorate program. I was in a hospital and there was a really tough supervisor I had. Now, I had been doing therapy for a while at this point. I've been doing it for 16 or 17 years now. I think at the time I was doing it for seven or eight years, I don't know, something like that. I had some experience. I wasn't green on, on therapy. There was still other things I was doing at my doctor program that I was still in training. So this supervisor, he was very old school, psychoanalytic, very stone face, no expression, doesn't give you anything, blank slate, the whole thing. And I remember having such a hard time initially because he was like, okay, I recognize you got some experience. That's great. So this is what everyone had to do. But And this isn't a new thing, but for the first, I'd say quarter, maybe two quarters, I would do therapy. I do a therapy session. At that time, we were recording them for educational purposes. And we would obviously get the client to consent if they would did. And most of them did. So then what I had to do was I had to not only give him the recordings, get to hear me do therapy, which is so intimidating, right? It's a good exercise, but it sucks. But also he would say, I want you to make a transcript of this. So I had a couple of clients. Each client for each session had to manually listen back and do the transcript verbatim, word for word. This took so much of my time. Yeah, that sounds incredibly time intensive. Very tedious, very tedious. On top of all the other things I was doing, I hated this, hated it. So there was a moment, I guess it's four months in, and he would listen to some of the audio. And then what we would do is we would have supervision every week. And he'd have, so the transcript, the audio, and then he would play back. And we would listen together after I've listened to it and after he's listened to it about 10 or 15 minutes. And now I would pick the 10 or 15 minutes and he would sometimes say intentionally, show me the part that you like didn't feel so good or show me the part you feel you did something well. And I hated doing this (laughs) and I tried not to complain about it. But as it started going on, I was like, look, this is getting real tough. No, nothing. Didn't give me anything. And I remember one time we were listening to a segment of a session. He stopped the tape or whatever, put pause on the computer or whatever. <laughs> and he says, there, where did you go? I was like, what do you mean? Where did I go? He goes, she was here, 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 here. And you went completely left. Why? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He's like, where were you? I was like, I don't, I, I don't know. Right. I was so like exasperated. I was just like, he goes, I don't care where you went. I don't care if you wanted to take it another place, but I need to know why and what's your rationale. And I could disagree with it, but at least you have it. If you don't know, that's the problem. And I was like, I don't know. (laughs) I was so like, and he was so right. It's one of the best pieces of training I ever got in terms of therapy. And this was after I had been doing it for a while. And so I got better because I was very tuned in. And he goes, active listening is really hard. And it's very hard to master and empathy and things like that. And he goes, but this is where you're connecting. It can't be where you want to go. It can't be necessarily what you think is right. It's where are they? And can they go there or can they not go there? What are they giving you? What are they not giving you? So we had other interactions with this. I think the second half of the year, he said, we'll go with the transcripts. 
you know, let's do that one more. Just one day out of nowhere. I was like, oh, God, relief. And then it was like, you know what? You don't need to send me the audio file. You're a good place. Now I trust you. Now I've built this. So there's like a kind of like real layered thing to this. And then eventually at the end, it was, how was the week? Session's good. What did you want to bring up? It was incredible how in a year I did that. Again, after doing therapy for seven, eight years, that just pushed me light years ahead. So I know exactly what you mean by that. And the second story I'll tell you is I told this story. So I had Isaac Butler on. He wrote a fantastic book called The Method about method acting. It's fabulous. People should read it. They can listen to my conversation with him. We've become buddies now. He's cool. We still keep in touch. So I tell this at more length, but the short version is, is that I did a Stanislavski method acting for about a year when I was younger. And I remember when I got asked to do it, the guy that was putting it on, he, he kind of ran the theater studio. He was doing a play on Crime and Punishment, which is probably my favorite novel at the very least, one of my favorite books. And I had always wanted to do a screenplay to adapt one, and definitely of that book. We had a long conversation and he really loved all of my knowledge and my love for it and my ideas. And he said, let's do this together. We'll adapt it together for the play. I said, great, let's do it. Yeah, this was like my favorite book. I had portions memorized at one point. I had it all marked up. I was ready to go. To this day, I read Crime and Punishment once a year. I read it every year. And he says, one condition, name it. He said, you have to do the nine or 10 months of Stanislavski method acting the whole thing and be in the play. I did a little acting when I was younger. I said, no, I said, I don't do that anymore. I said, I just want to do the writing part of it. He goes, no, you need to know this way. And you need to know this way for the actors. You have to be able to have that connection. And I pushed back and he said, that's the offer. Take it or leave it. Well, I don't have any money. He goes, do a scholarship. Don't worry about that. So I agreed. So I did it for 10 months. I was in the play, whatever. It wasn't like a big thing, but I did it for the, the screenplay piece of it. But I'm really glad I did it because I got to learn that kind of way of method acting and all the exercises and things you do and super, super cool, super, super cool stuff and long, long hours. And I got to write the screenplay. At the end of it, I told him, I said, I kind of resisted this, but you were totally right. There's no way I could have at all been able to explain, like I could explain the story and explain the right, like to understand. And again, that whole thing of like, how do you listen and how are you able to connect when someone can't get there? So it's really interesting because I don't think about any of those things when I do a podcast, but it's in there. <laughs> it's in there. After an experience like that, I can't imagine how it's not. Yeah, but those two things though are not in the podcast piece of it, but like kind of like clinical world in my day job is definitely listening, of course. And then even in that experience, in a performance space, it's there. So I'm pretty sure unconsciously or maybe implicitly comes out in a podcast with a guest. To touch on something you just discussed, because this was a big theme in my learning to be a director back in the day. This was a note from Judith. Whenever you're analyzing a script, make note of all the places where you really liked in the script or like the things that really excited you. But you also had to write down and make note of what she labeled as resistances. What parts of the script, what characters, what environments, what moments that for whatever reason, you as an individual human being while reading it, consciously or not, are resisting. And that could be like, I feel like this character is evil or I feel like this character is annoying. I don't buy this character's motivations. I find this scene dull. And you had to make note of it consciously and confront what you were resisting in order to get somewhere better. Because if you didn't confront what you were resisting, you couldn't do your best job as a director because you wouldn't be able to be there for the actors when they needed you. Because you would be biased against the text and it was your job to bring the text to life as best that you could. And if you were resisting things within the text by judging them, by thinking they were less than, by disagreeing with the writer's choices, whatever the resistance is, you were never going to break through to something better. And I find that in my view, you're able to apply that same philosophy to pretty much any aspect of life. We all have things inside of us or in front of us that we're resisting consciously or not that are getting in the way. And until we realize that we're resisting them and more importantly, why we're resisting them, only by confronting those things and breaking through can we actually grow and get to actually interesting places. And so just hearing you talk about in both of those stories, the thing that pops out to me is resistance. Yeah. Oh yeah. You wanting to resist doing this thing that 
for whatever reason, maybe it was scary or just a lot of hard work or just a huge time commitment, or maybe you weren't sure if you could do it or not. And then also with your therapy mentor, so to speak, almost resisting the feedback. But it's interesting. It's like once you confront it and you're like, okay, here's this thing that I didn't know was kind of in my way or blocking me or preventing me from being better or self-actualizing or breaking through, whatever it is. Once you confront the thing you're resisting, to your point, you can really truly grow and go to some really interesting and fulfilling places. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think by nature, I'm a stubborn person. And sometimes it works for me and sometimes it doesn't. But when I tell myself, don't be too rigid on this, don't be too stubborn, just just relax a little, push through. And then, yeah, you can really see some places where it goes. I'm curious, we don't have to make it too specific if you don't want to, but what's your process for like each podcast you do? Finding guests, how you choose them? Is it by topic? Is it by guest? What's the work you're putting into it? So I know you put an outline. How do you usually do that? And then do you have limits or boundaries or what's the contours of it for like doing it, like time limit or whatever? And then afterwards, like how much are you kind of editing it or not? How much do you put into promoting it or sharing it or whatever? Just I'm curious about like what's your start to end process and less so about like the specifics. You can tell me specifics, but like more so what's the underlying ethos about all of that as you're doing it? So in terms of how I choose my guests, it really is a function of what I'm interested in and what is either engaging me or agitating me at a given moment in time. And I have a pretty wide array of interests. So if you go back to the first 10 to 15 episodes of the podcast, you can get an idea of what was on my mind at the time. So episode one, how to bridge political divides with John Wood Jr. of Braver Angels. Episode two, expanding what it means to be American with journalist Zed Jelani. Episode three, a challenge to move beyond racialized identities with activist Anaya Fuller and Amon. Episode four, racial nationalism is a really dumb idea with Wilfred Riley. Episode five, the inherent value of lived experiences with Roderick Graham. So the things that were animating me and interesting me in 2020 and the years prior were race, identity, how we conceptualize ourselves, how we conceptualize others, how we talk about our identities, how we talk about the identities of others. And how I felt that I still feel this way, that the ways that we talk about ourselves and other people in terms of our overlapping and multiple identities is really shallow a lot of the time and not very productive. And I was looking to have conversations about these topics around identity in ways that I felt were more holistic, less combative, more interesting, more empathetic. And that was what was really animating me at the time and what caused me to first start the podcast. I've always to my earlier point, Xavier, been interested in identity and what makes a person do what they do, think what they think, say what they say. And that will always be a kind of through line in all of my episodes in many ways. But my interests go so far beyond that. I've been a big nerd around tech-related topics from electric vehicles, self-driving cars, rockets, VR, augmented reality, clean energy, nuclear power. These have been my interests for many years. And while when I started the podcast, it had a heavy focus on social issues, cultural issues, identity, race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera, I started burning out just talking about those subjects after the first like 25 episodes. And you can see over the next couple of dozen after that, the topics just start expanding and expanding to a point where now the name is meta. It has dual meaning. It's both Where do we go next with something like nuclear power? Where do we go next with stand-up comedy? Where do we go next when we're trying to solve poverty in America? But it's also, where do we go next in terms of the thing that is going to be interesting me a month from now? (laughs) Because I, I go through little mini obsessions. Like last year, I went through a huge chess phase that lasted about six months where I was playing probably 10 games of chess on my phone every day, nonstop. I was watching YouTube videos on chess. I was reading books about chess. I was just obsessed with chess. And then one day I wasn't. And I still like chess. I still play with my wife, Anne, occasionally, but not every day. But when I'm in it and when I'm obsessing over something is when I want to talk to people about it while the iron is hot in my mind, so to speak, because that's when I'm at my most excitable and engaged. In terms of how much time I spend with each episode, It ranges, but it averages about 10 hours of prep time per guest. Sometimes it's much more. Sometimes it's a little bit less. 
I would say, I don't think I've ever gone under eight hours of prep for any particular guest. I don't think I've ever gone over 20 hours on the high end. That's how much I would say I, I prep. And then obviously there's the actual recording. Then there's the editing afterwards. Then there's creating the audiograms. Every decision that you make is also a decision to not do something else. Every minute I spend doing A is a minute I could be spending doing B, but I'm actively not doing B. And so it's always about a balance of how much time do I spend on every task that is directly or loosely related to the act of podcasting and where do I put my efforts? Yeah, a lot of that resonates for me as well. I don't know how to do promotion. I don't know how to like formally do that. I'm pretty terrible at it. I guess that there's a question I'm having. I have an answer. So I want to ask you first and see what your answer is and then I can give mine. In 10 years or 20 years and you look back on the podcast and you see all of the conversations you had that you shared publicly with the world, essentially. What do you want to feel when you look back on the time that you did the podcast? Maybe you're still doing it then. I don't know. But how do you want to feel about this period, at least, or doing it as like what you've left for others and what you've left in the world? Like, how do you want it to be received or how do you want to feel about it? I guess I'll probably be thinking the same thing that I think ahead of and after every individual episode that I record. I hope I didn't waste anyone's time and that they felt valued. And in the same way, I hope that the audience, as they listen to it, feel valued because I'm respecting their time. I don't always succeed. I'm sure of it. I don't always succeed because I'm not always at my best. I God, I don't even know if I'm at my best right now. You're doing fantastic. It's been such a good conversation so far. So thank you. I don't mean that in any kind of compliment fishing sort of way. I mean that I think like it's very rare for any human being doing anything to be at their best all the time, or even for like very long periods of time. I think that the human equilibrium, regardless of task, is to be about average. Because I think to actually be like really good and locked in and present and firing on all cylinders and like all the different things in any profession is incredibly hard to do. But specifically, if I'm making the conscious choice to on my own volition, in my own free time, put something out for public consumption, There is something within me that does not want to put it out unless I feel like it's worth putting out. And for me, that means I need to feel like it's worth someone's time to consume it. And I need to feel like it was worth my time to do. Because if I don't, then I'm not going to do it or I'll do a bad job at it. When I'm looking back like 20 years from now, I hope that I did a good enough job not wasting anyone's time, including my own. But what about you? I have a slightly different perspective. I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic for that. I'm a little darker with it. So sorry if I get a little dark here. The thing I fear the most is that I don't have enough time on the planet. I always have felt that. I'm kind of a experienced glutton. <laughs> and I know that I'm still young, but I won't be. And time on earth is a blink. And I will not be able to experience all the things I want to experience. And that is what terrifies me. Less so about dying. It's more of, I, I don't have time. In the grand scheme of things, I'm nobody. <laughs> you know, I'm not making a huge impact, maybe like other people have. And that's okay. I don't really want to do that, actually, in, in some regard. But if somebody listens to, you know, I'm not doing this in 20, 25 years or 100 years from now or whatever, and they see these audio files, I hope that there's a timelessness to them, that people could listen to the conversation and really learn or glean something from it on a variety of topics, on a variety of things that can help them. It can help them unlock something. It can help them think about it a different way, that they can hear different viewpoints and they can make their own decision about it because they've had more informed with not just reading something, but hearing something explained by someone that has a position or whatever. I said at one point that it's not about me in any way. And that's true. I'm I'm very much about the guest. But there's another sense in which it's entirely about me. I pick the guests. I pick the topics. I like these things. I do it for me. I don't do it for anybody else necessarily. So listeners get to come along for the ride. They don't know what I'm releasing on Monday. They don't know what I'm releasing on Thursday. It could be about philosophy, history, 16th century Dutch artists. It's not going to be too far off usually, but yeah, it can be sometimes really different. And I, I like that. I think that's cool. So in that way, I guess it is in terms of the topics and the guests and very thoughtful about that. To that point, I think in any creative endeavor, whatever that might be, You have to be selfish in order to make something good. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do it for yourself 
whatever that is, whether it's a painting, a conversation, writing, music, et cetera, you have to be driven by a selfishness of like, I am making this because this interests me. Because if you try to make it for someone else, one, you'll never succeed because we only know our own minds and our own interests. But two, I think like people can feel it. Like you can feel when someone's trying to make it for someone else. Some selfishness is required in an endeavor like this. Absolutely. And there will be moments where the way I ask a question or the questions I ask, and sometimes I do give my opinions about things with conversations with people. I don't know. My daughter's almost out of the house, but I told her in a very kind of dark humor, you know, when I'm gone and I'm dead, you can listen to so many hours of your dad if you want to on so many topics with so many people, right? And she's like, oh, dad, don't say that. I don't want to hear that, (laughs) right? But I don't know. I think that there's something that lives on when you're not. There are moments captured in time that, you know, that are there. And I think to that end about the, you know, I do this for me and who I pick the guests and the questions I ask and how I do it is for me. And I think for that, I have this incredible weight of responsibility, not weight like it's holding me down, but I enjoy what I do and it's a labor of love. Again, I don't make money off of this, any of that, but I, I have that weight of responsibility in a good way, kind of like a badge of honor sorts of like, yeah, you, you do this and you do it right. You do it the best you can to be responsible, ethical, clear some epistemic humility, transparent in some ways, all of those things. If you're going to say something publicly, and if you're going to say something publicly, maybe with some sense of authority or something, you should do everything you possibly can to be honest about what you know, what you don't know, how responsible you are with it. That's for me super important because you don't want to directly or indirectly maybe mislead someone or anything like that. And I'm not perfect. I I get things wrong. But I think if you try and you make that attempt as best as you possibly can, I think you can have good product. I think you can have good art, the art of good public conversation, if you will. I mean, not that I'm a standard by any means, but I think if just generally people find out how to do that for themselves in those kind of contexts, I think society and communities could be a lot better in that way. So I try to do what I think many people should do. And I get it wrong, but I try my very hardest. So you want to be of value and you want to leave something of value. Yep. It's very nicely put. Are there any podcast related goals that you're aiming to achieve in 2024? Because I I think you and I are similar in this way that for me to stay engaged with anything, I need to have goals or metrics that I'm aiming for every month, every year. What does that look like for you? This is going to sound like a contradiction, but I want as many people to listen to it as possible. (laughs) So I'd like to grow. I'd like to have more people subscribe to the Substack and stuff or on the YouTube channel. It's fine. But yeah, I'd like more people listening to it. And it's not just the episodes. There's an archive of any topic I think that most people would like. I did two hours on the history of menopause. I don't hear a lot of podcasts do that. Like you can listen to that. And Susan was lovely. She was great. Or, you know, whatever the past conversations are. So it's not just what's the next thing. That's another thing I don't know how to do is how do I keep lifting and promoting previous episodes that I really believe in? I don't know how to keep doing that. It's hard to do. I don't think anyone's cracked that though, to be honest. So more people, I want more people to listen to it. That's a goal. There's just a a general list of people that I would like the A-listers that I would like to get, Michael Callahan and and others. So, you know, I got one. (laughs) There's a couple of people that some big names I'd like to get, but I'm not like obsessed with it. My thing is like, it will happen when it needs to happen and that's fine. Guests aside, is there a particular topic that you don't feel like you've touched on yet that you absolutely know you got to touch on this year? So this year, I'm trying to really pick and decide how I want to handle the United States presidential election this year because it's an election year and it's, what's the phrase? This is the most important election of our lifetime. (laughs) I don't think that's true, but I think a lot of them have consequence in some way. And I think this one's kind of unique, right? A former president going against an incumbent president. There's some uniqueness there. But I listen to some political podcasts and I listen to like the legacy media and I see what's online and I just don't want to do the same bullshit. I want people to be like, okay, I hear all that. So that is the kind of thing where I do listen to all this stuff. What can I offer here that's not to be contrarian, but to be like productive, There's a kind of primary schedule and the convention and then the general election and maybe the debates if they happen. And so I'm thinking about certain people, but really trying to produce something of value that's a little bit different and helpful. I might get it wrong, but I'm trying to do some of that. I haven't done religion on my podcast, which that's a whole other conversation for another day. I think there's some purpose for why I haven't done that personally. 
I'm not afraid of it by any means. I'm pretty critical about dogma and doctrine or organized religions, but I do want to do more of that, I think. But again, in careful ways. So yeah, I think the election is the big thing, but I don't want it to be like, this is an election politics podcast. So I'm trying to spread it out, be very thoughtful about it and how I do it. So that's one thing, growing more people. But as far as everything else, I'm going to keep doing the same thing. A lot of different topics, a lot of different guests, long ones, short ones. That's all going to be the same. But in terms of all the particulars for this year. Yeah, I'm always trying to, I haven't really said it here in this conversation, but every single episode, I always think there's something I could have done better. Almost this obsessive pursuit of trying to get better on the next one. How I ask the questions. I'm hypercritical of myself. I like what I do. And sometimes I'll be like, yeah, that was a good question. I knocked that one out. Yeah, that's a good one. But then they're like, oh, all these other ones are terrible. So I am trying to kind of with each one I do get better and better and better. And yeah, what about you? Quick follow-up question to something that you said at the very start about what motivated you to start the podcast. You wanted to talk with people from both sides of the issue. So to reference an example you used like abortion, you would talk to someone pro-life and then you would talk to someone pro-choice and those episodes would come out relatively close to one another. Yeah. Do you see yourself doing more episodes where you have both of those people on at the same time and you facilitate a respectful conversation? I welcome it. Please, if you're interested, you can reach me at my email, get me on my sub Like, I mean, I always want to do that. That's always on the table. It's just people are usually nervous and not everybody, but I've asked certain people, even like bigger names. And they're like, I thought about this. There's somebody else I had on. You guys disagree. Do you think there would be something productive? And they might say like, maybe not at the moment or kindly decline or I'm not sure. But yes, I will gladly, I would gladly love to do that. For my part, it's going to be difficult to answer without just repeating everything you said, but you kind of... <laughs> so there's a ditto on that. <laughs> yeah, my challenge is just to continuously try to improve and also to just keep diving and delving into new and interesting and fascinating topics that are largely or at least a little foreign to me because I feel like I do my best work... Hey there. When I'm you're hearing this, you're exactly the person terrified. this message is for. If I know something if you're backwards a fan and forwards, of the show, if I'm too familiar with something, giving it a five -star I can tend to get a little bit lazy because, because I just take for granted all the knowledge I have around the subject. Sharing one of your favorite but episodes if I feel, especially friend, if it relates to another person or if I feel like I have an obligation to them. Or that barista down the street who always knows your drink order. Because those two small actions have outsized impact. I hope I don't mess this up because this is not really my field of expertise. And will help the show I don't really know much about your subject and I have to try and at least get to a place where I can confidently talk about interview someone topics. who is an expert on this subject. But it subject. needs to be said. Granted, you I can't just download a 10 or 20 years of knowledge deal. into my brain so thank you. in the next week. But if I can at least learn enough about it that I can ask curious questions as a lay person and at least act as a audience avatar of sorts and play that role so that I can hopefully bring the audience along with me and they can learn as I'm learning. That's something I always love doing. I want to definitely delve more into creative industries. Like I've really enjoyed talking with stand-up comedians and actors, and I want to definitely do more of that. I really enjoy talking with founders of really innovative and cutting edge companies. I've always enjoyed that. So I'm hoping to do more of that this year. Also, the goal is just to slowly but surely do more of these, to do more conversations and get better at being a conversationalist who does not have to lean on just the act of hosting, because that is kind of a comfort blanket for me. Because I have, as I imagine you feel the same way, like I have gotten good at it through repetition. And also it is just easier to be the person asking the questions than being the person being asked. That's probably the biggest challenge, although that's outside of the podcast, as it were. That's just something podcast related that I'm hoping to improve upon. But yeah, I would say that's where I'm going next in 2024, Xavier. Mm, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, I'm sure our paths will continue to converge in many ways. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'll call you the Fellowship of the Ring. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. This was fun. This was fun, man. This was so much fun. It felt, yeah, definitely different for me, but I loved every second of it. I mean, it felt good and natural and productive, and I stand by all of it. I think it was great. I don't think it was just the two of us that just hit record on it, and that was it. I think at this point, it's not like we just started the podcast and we got 10 episodes out. Like, we have plenty of episodes out. I think my impression is, does this get the most listens out of all of our episodes? Probably not. But 
I think for people that listen to it a lot, I think we'll get a, a lot out of it. If I saw two people that did a podcast that I listened to, two podcasts, and they had this kind of conversation, I would totally listen to that. I would be like super into it, be like, wow, like almost like a kind of behind the scenes. But then to your point, it's like I get to know a little bit about this person a little bit more. This person I listen to all the time. I like that stuff. And I find that a lot of people like that stuff. So let's test that theory. Yeah. If you're listening to this conversation right now and you want to take two to five minutes out of your day, please email Michael at where we go next dot com or converging dialogues at gmail dot com. Or email both of us, CC whoever you want. You get to choose who gets CC'd. Yeah. And let us know what you think. Because if you find these kinds of conversations, these more freewheeling, a little more conversational, a little more casual conversations, interesting, whether it's just between me and Xavier exclusively, or you just want to hear either or both of us do more of these on our respective podcasts that lean more into the personality of the host themselves, let us know. Mm -hmm. This is a new thing for both of us, something we're trying out. And if you hated it, but more importantly, if you loved it or you liked it or you want more of it, let us know. It helps us get a better sense of what our respective audiences, which do have some crossover, find engaging. Yeah, ditto to all of that. Perfectly said. Well, Xavier, I've had a great time. And from here, we'll just take it back to our usual stomping grounds, which is our group chat with Angel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Likewise, this was such a blast. Thank you so much, Michael, for doing this. And I can't wait to share it with everybody and, and get the response. Me too.